Hello and welcome to today's Bible reading and devotional time. This is Tuesday, May the 21st, 2024. It is day 44 of our reading through John. And hit that subscribe bar before we get too far into this. And then the notification bell when it comes up. And don't forget to comment on these videos, like these videos, share these videos. I think I need to adjust this mic. Happens sometimes. Okay, we are continuing in John chapter 10, where the Pharisees are still going after Jesus. Uh, we're going there. They've got a renewed effort going to try and stone him. That was the sort of thing that happened pretty frequently uh, because they considered him a blasphemer. And that was the penalty under the law was uh, blasphemers were to be stoned. So... We'll go now and start our reading in verse uh, 31 to help us to try and get the full context. <clears throat> the, then the Jews took up stones again to stone him. And Jesus answered them, Many good works I have shown you from my Father. For which of those works do you stone me? And the Jews answered him, saying, For a good work we do not stone you, but for blasphemy, because you being a man make yourself God. So they were getting it, that he is claiming deity. But Jesus answered them, Is it not written in your law, I said, You are gods? And if he called them gods, to whom the word of God came, and the scripture cannot be broken, do you say of him whom the Father sanctified, sent into the world, and sent into the world, you are blaspheming, because I said, I am the Son of God. If I do not do the works of my Father, do not believe me. But if I do, though you do not believe me, believe the works, that you may know and believe that the Father is in me and I in him. Therefore they sought again to seize him, but he escaped out of their hand. And he went away again beyond the Jordan to the place where John was baptizing at first. There he stayed. Then many came to him and said, John performed no sign, but all the things that John spoke about this man were true. And many believed in him there. Okay, so he's got some that are believing in him. So let's look at this verse, uh, chapter th or, uh, verse 30. The Jews, or Jesus, uh, uh, they said to Jesus, we're stoning you not... For any good works or for blasphemy, you, a mere man, claim to be God. Uh, that would be blasphemy, and that would uh, warrant stoning under the old law. See, they understood him correctly. Uh, some say, like the Jehovah's Witnesses, say that the Jews misunderstood what Jesus was saying here. And if that was true, why didn't Jesus correct them? Hey, wait a minute, guys, you got it all wrong. Okay, I'm, I'm not claiming to be God. All right, I'm just some philosophical itinerant teacher who's wandering around saying a bunch of stuff that 2,000 years from now nobody's going to know what I said, or and yet they're still going to claim to follow me, yet they're going to deny all the miracles and everything that I did. Well, see, that's kind of a paraphrase of what a lot of liberal Christians think today. But here's what John Wycliffe had to say, uh, or rather it's not John Wycliffe, it's the Wycliffe Bible Commentary. They said the Jews brushed aside all reference to works which they could not deny, and returned to the issue of Jesus' words, which they felt bound to deny on the ground of blasphemy. To them, Jesus was a man who had dared to make himself out to be God. So on this grounds, they sought his death now, and on this grounds, they would also seek it later. Then Jesus, in verse 34, and this is going to be a little bit of a difficult passage to uh, uh, understand, but uh, he answered and said to them, Is it not written in your law, I said, you are gods? If he called them gods, to whom the word of God came, and the scripture cannot be broken, do you say of him whom the Father sanctified and sent into the world, you are blaspheming, because I said, I am of God? Remarks we're going to take now are from uh, Brandt and Krauss and their NIV commentary in the College Press NIV commentary series. And they said, what follows is one of the most difficult passages for interpretation in all the New Testament. In response to the objection from the Jews that he has claimed to be God, Jesus quotes Psalm 82, verse 6, which says, I have said you are God's. 
we may identify at least three separate issues in attempting to understand this passage. First, does Jesus intend us to understand that he is no more than a human being with a special relationship to God? Or conversely, does he mean that there are many other humans who have similar status with God as he does? The key to answering these questions is to look more closely at Psalm 82. In a somewhat poetic way, this short psalm is a pointed message to the corrupt judges of the nation uh, of Israel. They defend the unjust and show partiality to the wicked. The word of God to them in 82, Psalm 82, verse 6, is a reminder that they are uh, that while they are gods, notice it's a little g, uh, they're entrusted with godlike authority to judge. And sons of the Most High, which is a parallel expression, uh, but a bit more human, they are still very mortal, therefore subject to the ultimate judgment by God himself. The logic of Jesus, therefore, is that if the Jewish scriptures itself refers to human judges as gods, he has every right to refer to himself as God's son. For Jesus, this is even more justified because the Father uh, sent him, or rather set him apart as his very own and set him into the world. Jesus' point is that he can hardly be accused of blasphemy if he has scriptural precedent for his terminology. A second issue is the question as to why Jesus says the Old Testament passage in the law when it's actually in the Psalms. Did Jesus or John make a mistake here? But to see Jesus as making a common human error is unnecessary here. While the law is most specific, the first five books of the Old Testament, the concept had a range of meaning for the first century Jews. It could refer to the specific legal code of books like Leviticus or the books attributed to Moses, which is Genesis or Deuteronomy, which would include Leviticus, or even uh, Jewish scriptures in a broader sense. The last meaning is intended by Jesus here, and would have included the Psalms. This may be seen in Jesus' qualifications of the law as the writings of those whom, uh, from whom the word of God came. Third, we should consider the implications of, this, of the parenthetical statement, and the scripture cannot be broken. You notice in pretty much all the English Bibles, I think, it is uh, in parentheses. The verse has been a key text for those who hold to a doctrine of biblical inerrancy. The battle cry of inerrances, inerrantness has been, Scripture cannot be broken, but this is a justified use of the text or illegitimate proof text. See. Third, we should consider the implications of the parenthetical statement, and the Scriptures cannot be broken. Uh, pretty much all English Bibles do put that in parentheses. And this verse has been a key text for those who hold to a doctrine of biblical inerrancy. The battle cry of inerrantis has been, Scripture cannot be broken. But is this a justified use of the text or an illegitimate proof texting? As one who is a friend of the doctrine of inerrancy, my views here are certainly biased. And over a century ago, Charles Hodge defined the doctrine of inerrancy as the position that Scripture is free from all error, whether of doctrines, fact, or precept. While some of the terminology used by defenders of inerrancy may be of relatively recent origin, the idea that Scripture is without error has been the historic position of the Church until the last two centuries. This comes from the view that God is an active participant in the writing of Scripture. And since God can neither make mistakes nor be deliberately deceptive, we must conclude that Scripture is without error. According to the Inheritance, this position may be traced back to Jesus himself, as demonstrated in this verse. But Jesus didn't say, as far as we know, the Scripture cannot be broken. That was put in as a parenthetical note. And then in John chapter 10 and verse 37 to 39, we uh, need to consider some things there. First, let's look at the text again. If I do not do the works of my Father, do not believe me. But if I do, though you do not believe me, believe the works, that you may know and believe that the Father is in me and I in him. Therefore they sought again to seize him, but he escaped out of their hand. Okay, so you know, one would have thought that it would be it would have convinced in, in them and melted their hearts. This is, uh, I believe, from this Matthew Henry, 
uh, in his commentary. Uh, but here uh, we are, the, but their hearts hardened. That's what it's getting at. Uh, they didn't, oh, you know what? Yeah, we need to rethink this whole Jesus thing. <laughs> they have their heels dug in. And so they attacked him uh, by force. They sought to take him. Because he had fully answered, and they sought to take him because he had fully answered their charges of blasphemy and brushed it off. They were so soundly, the Pharisees were so soundly defeated that they could not, without severely damaging their own reputation, go on with their attempts to stone him. Therefore, they contrived to seize him and prosecute him as an offender against the state. When they were constrained to drop the attempt by a popular tumult, they would try uh, what they could do under color of a legal process. And that's basically what uh, they did there. And then because uh, he persevered in the same testimony uh, concerning himself, they perished in their malice against him. Because Jesus preserved in the same testimony concerning himself, they persisted in their malice again. They kept going. They weren't going to cut him any slack or uh, even think about maybe the possibility he could be who he said he was. And what he had said before, he did in effect say again, for the faithful witness never departs from what he has once said. And therefore, having the same provocation, they express the same resentment and justify their attempt to stone him by another attempt to uh, take him. So they don't know what to do with this guy. They want to try and take him, but they can't. They And uh, really the stoning of somebody really had to be done with Roman authority. So, what do we do? Well, stay tuned. Uh, we'll, we'll continue on with this. Actually, next time we get into chapter 11, we'll be looking at Lazarus and Jesus raising him uh, back from the dead. And now for Tuesday, our prayer topics are, uh, we pray for the church, the local congregation and the church universal, that is worldwide. Uh, it's uh, undergoing some hard times in a lot of places. Some places it's flourishing. But a lot of places right now, it's having a hard time. So uh, let's go to God in prayer. And we thank you, Lord, for today. Thank you for helping us this far through the week. And we want to lift up the church, Lord. Lift up your community for prayers today. And we want to pray for our members. Pray for them all to be strengthened. Some, I know, in my congregation are suffering from various uh, health ailments. And just pray your healing hand on them. And if if they can't be uh, healed, if it's not in your will, then we pray for them to have a peaceful moment to go and be with you. And we want to pray for strength for the Christians here and boldness that we can proclaim the truth of your gospel. And doors will be opened, and especially in countries where the gospel is persecuted. Help us here, Lord, to be the light we need to be to walk in your path and forgive us of our sins. In Jesus' name, amen. So if you have any comments or questions, you can leave them in the comment section below, or you can send them to me at 2timothy4.2.3 at gmail.com. That is going to wrap it up for this video. Thank you for watching, and we will see you in the next video. I am done, and I am out.